Yes, that's a very interesting analogy, David, but is it a useful one? Well, yes, we, in our research, are finding it's really very useful because, I mean, how do you talk about the, the psychology of a, a lump of silicon like this? I mean, how do you try to understand the problem a person has when he comes to this for the first time? You see, in one way of thinking about it, you say, okay, this is the opening to a building. How does he find his way in? And a lot of the problems with computers is that you can't find your way in very easily or find your way around it very easily. Because even if you've got a little bit of experience and you just bring up a directory um, on, on the screen like this, you can find you get an instruction that doesn't help you at all. If you give it uh, another instruction that might be a little more helpful, you'll find that all you get is a list of codes. And these are really like different rooms. You can get into them if you know how, but you don't even know whether they link up to other rooms and how you can get back into the corridor again. Yes, just like a building, in fact. What you need then is a bit more signposting, a bit more guidance. Yes, somehow or other you need to be able to be shown your way around it and the problem is that the people who have designed these systems have really built them from the inside out. They know what's going on inside there but it's very difficult for them to understand how they express that to people who are coming to it cold. How should they help us? Uh, maps, that sort of thing? Well, th that certainly would be helpful. I mean, uh, some manufacturers are beginning to supply some sort of uh, uh, flow diagram or some sort of indication of where the different constituents are and how they relate to each other. But the thing about a map, really, is that it's only really useful when you're lost. Yes, and of course, on this one, you can't even get into it if you don't know that directory code. You can't get into it to, to even get lost. What's the alternative to that sort of thing? Well, there are a variety of alternatives that really relate to trying to understand what the person is trying to do with the computer, how the user is actually making use of it. For instance, if you've just got a simple set of operations to do, all you need is a simple menu that has been customized to give the list of operations that are needed to do what you want to do. But if you're developing a great uh, system and you need all sorts of documents and so on, then it's very useful to have all these different constituents sort of laid out as if they were sort of on your desk. But the really remarkable thing is that really they're only just beginning to think about this type of development and they were, the manufacturers were really encouraged to do that by the Macintosh, which was really the first computer that really tried to respond to the user. I mean, it's not the whole answer. You can still get lost inside it, but at least it was a step in the direction of sort of user-friendliness. Right. Thank you very much, David. We'll come back to you. Mac. Well, the success of the Macintosh as a friendly computer encouraged software writers to kind of gift wrap the operating system. Microsoft came up with Windows and digital research produced GEM, Amstrad is packaging GEM into its new IBM clones. Paul Bailey, why have Amstrad done this? Well, Amstrad is providing a very low cost computer that is going to appeal to a whole new generation of users. And they wanted to provide a screen environment that those users could relate to. Well, we've got it up here on an Atari. Can you take us through it? This is what it looks like when you switch it on. Yes, this screen uh, provides an, an analogy of a desktop. And the commands are displayed in a consistent way along the top of the screen. As you point to these commands, the options drop down. And you can move to any command that you want to execute simply by pointing to it. Now, quite often, what users want to do is to manipulate files. And files are contained, are contained on disks. Now, the disks in this case are depicted by filing cabinets, A and B. Now, I can open up A, and its contents will be displayed in a window. Here you can see a number of symbols depicting document files, and a different symbol on the left here, which actually depicts a folder. And that folder can contain other files. So I can open up that folder simply by clicking on it and see what it contains. Well, this folder contains two budgets that I've been working on, plus it contains the program called Planner that I've been using to build those budgets. I could go in and execute Planner simply by clicking on its symbol. But what I really want to do here is to copy these files into a different disk that I could take home and maybe, say, work at home. Now, I've got a, a blank disk loaded in B. I can open up B. There's nothing in it. I may want to create a new folder, so I go up to File, click on New Folder. I'm going to call it Plan, OK? And now it's creating me a new folder called Plan. Now, what I simply want to do in this case is to actually pick up these files, which I do by scanning across them, selecting them, and I want to deposit these files in my new folder. So what do I do? I pick them up, 
drag them down over to my new folder. It gives me the option to confirm. I confirm that, and it's now copying those files into that folder from you one disk to the other. You can hear the disk moving right now. It's copying them one to the other. It's very straightforward. What would happen if you wanted to actually get rid of those files? Very simple. Um, I can just go down here, select the folder, and then just pull it over to the waste paper basket. And uh, it allows me to confirm, always a very sensible precaution. And I say, OK, delete them. Now, if I had to do those in standard operating system commands, they would be quite complicated, wouldn't they? Well, that would typically take 10 DOS command lines. And every one of those has to be typed in very carefully. We can see them there now. If you take one of those, copy, space, A, colon, backslash, budget, backslash, budget, one, space, B, colon, etc., etc. Just one tiny mistake in that structure, and it isn't going to work. And, in fact, all we did was use the clicker to do those very simply. It's a lot easier than using DOS, that's for sure. Well, Gem is sitting on top of the operating system, hiding it completely, which is what Microsoft, newer offering, Windows does as well. David Fraser, your approach with Windows is a little bit different from that, isn't it? <coughs> well, no, not Mac, not at the simplest level. Uh, Windows uh, is very useful where uh, repetitive but complex tasks uh, are, are required to be used. They with Windows, they can be used very, very easily. Mm -hmm. But the, the real uh, fundamental use of Windows, which most computer manufacturers use, it is to give a consistent interface to different programs uh, running on the computer and more importantly, to allow different programs to be run simultaneously in the memory of the computer. That's quite difficult to understand in talking about it. Can we right. have a look at it? It's much easier to show than to talk about, certainly. Well, here um, I have a typical word processor, and I have started to create uh, a document in this word processor. I would like to uh, insert a table of data, and this table of data will be created separately um, in a spreadsheet program. So let me uh, open up my spreadsheet program. So here we are with Microsoft Multiplan um, with some data on butterflies. Let me show that we can add some more data. There we are. Um, and the totals have been calculated. I now wish to take this table of data and copy it across uh, to my word process document. Let me select the area which I want to copy across issue the copy command, position my cursor where I would like the information to be inserted, and hey presto, we have it inserted. Doing that in the operating system commands will be very, very hard, I suspect, or even it may be impossible. Very hard, and in many cases certainly impossible, but I think here the, the simplicity and the speed with which it was undertaken is most impressive. It certainly is. Well, these are two popular products to help simplify the front ends. What are the developments do you see in the future, Paul? Well, the current generation of software does a good job of depicting a desktop environment. But in the future, we're going to find much higher quality, higher resolution displays. And th that's going to require a lot of extra processing to provide. The chip manufacturers are providing or are developing now specialist chips that greatly enhance the processing of graphics information some 20 to 30 times. And that's going to allow computer screens to really show um, a desktop environment in the same kind of quality and resolution as typeset information on your desk. It's nearly going to look like a desktop rather than a computer representation. David, what do you see? Okay, the, the horsepower now available uh, really allows programmers to start to think about developing much more interactive software. Software that interacts with a new user, user for the first time really helps them to become familiar and comfortable with that software. What it really does is increases the slope of the learning curve. More importantly though, um, what it, uh, in the future, uh, programmers can use this power to make the software adapt itself to the user so that when the software detects that the user is becoming a competent user, it just doesn't bother to give them all the prompts um, along the way. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Well, Gem and Windows there, David. Any comments on what you've just seen? Well, I don't think it's quite as straightforward as your two sales managers have indicated, really. They're getting very excited about new chips and high-resolution graphics, but really, you know, the more you've got on the screen, the easier it is to get lost, like losing something on a desk, really. And I think people ought to be warned against being seduced by the pretty pictures and the moving arrows, because really, for some applications, something much simpler might be actually far more appropriate. 
I think there's always going to be the risk of people sort of getting lost inside computer systems until we really have front ends that are much more intelligent. What, what is an intelligent front end? Well, psychologists are actually studying this and trying to get some clear answers to that. But essentially, it's really a front end that tries to understand what you're trying to do and then helps you to do it. Let's hope we get it. David, thank you very much. Well, that's it for this week. Over on BBC One, it's the annual Children in Need Appeal. If you want to pledge money, you can do so on Micronet, page 80403 of Prestel. Or you can go down to your local information technology centre. They'll be open now where you could be able to pledge money electronically. So until the same time next week, good night.